By the late 1960s, the thunder of GE's great gas turbines was fading fast. Their appetite for fuel and relentless maintenance demands were bleeding Union Pacific dry. And that's exactly when EMD delivered its counterpunch. A machine so powerful, so reliable, and so well-timed that it buried GE's turbine dream overnight. The DDA40X wasn't just another locomotive. It was the diesel-electric titan that proved the turbine age was over, silencing those howling giants for good. It was the 1960s when America's railroads were locked in the horsepower wars. EMD, General Electric, and Alco were pushing the absolute limits of power and design, each trying to build the locomotive that would dominate the next decade. For a while, GE looked absolutely unstoppable with their revolutionary approach. Their gas turbine electric locomotives screamed across Union Pacific's desert routes like massive power plants on rails, earning the nickname Big Blows from crews who could hear them thundering through the landscape for miles in every direction. These weren't your grandfather's locomotives by any stretch. Instead of traditional pistons and cylinders, they used industrial gas turbines to generate enormous amounts of power. The turbine drove a massive generator, which then powered the traction motors with incredible force. The result was loud, fast, and incredibly strong, what everyone believed was the future of American railroading. Union Pacific was completely sold on the concept and invested heavily in the technology. They desperately wanted to haul longer, heavier trains across those endless western landscapes without needing multiple locomotives coupled together. The turbines seemed like the perfect solution, sleek, powerful, and undeniably futuristic. GE rolled out massive units capable of producing up to 8,500 horsepower, making them some of the most powerful locomotives ever built at that time. When those mechanical beasts thundered through the desert at full throttle, the sound was unlike anything else on the rails. A deep, roaring howl that announced their presence long before they appeared on the horizon. For several years, it genuinely seemed like GE had cracked the code that no one else could solve. The turbines represented clean-burning, futuristic technology that could haul massive freight loads at unprecedented speeds. Railroad executives and industry observers alike believed they were witnessing the dawn of a new era in locomotive technology. But behind that impressive raw power lurked a fatal flaw that would eventually doom the entire program. Those turbines guzzled fuel like there was no tomorrow, especially during the operational conditions that railroads faced every single day. They were most efficient when running flat out at maximum power, but the moment they throttled down, whether navigating mountain grades, performing switching duties, or even just idling between runs, fuel consumption skyrocketed to economically unsustainable levels. When fuel was cheap in the early 60s, railroad accountants could overlook these inefficiencies. But by the late 60s, as fuel costs began climbing and operational budgets tightened, the numbers were becoming impossible to ignore. The maintenance demands proved even more challenging than the fuel inefficiencies. Turbines required highly specialized expertise that only a few depots nationwide could provide. Every breakdown meant long waits for qualified technicians and repair bills that could cripple a railroad's budget. Beyond the mechanical headaches, the turbines came with serious crew comfort issues. They were so loud that engineers and conductors had to wear heavy-duty ear protection just to endure a full shift without risking permanent hearing damage. Compounding these issues was their lack of operational flexibility. Unlike conventional diesels, turbine locomotives couldn't be easily paired with other units in standard multiple-unit configurations, limiting their usefulness in real-world freight operations. By the late 1960s, the writing was on the wall. Railroads desperately needed something that combined raw power with real-world reliability and economic viability. That's precisely when EMD decided to make its move. While GE was chasing their turbine-powered dreams and burning through development budgets, EMD was quietly working on something completely different. Something that nobody in the industry saw coming. Since the 1940s, EMD had established itself as the absolute gold standard of diesel locomotive power and reliability. Their revolutionary FT and F-series diesels had accomplished what many industry experts thought was impossible. 
they had successfully pushed mighty steam engines into permanent retirement across American railroads. When railroad executives thought about EMD locomotives, the words that immediately came to mind were reliable, efficient, and remarkably easy to maintain. Railroads trusted EMD because their locomotives consistently worked day in and day out, without the drama and unexpected failures that plagued other manufacturers. EMD's locomotives were built with practicality in mind, featuring modular designs that allowed worn or damaged components to be swapped quickly with minimal downtime. This approach made them far easier to maintain. Crews could keep locomotives in service without lengthy overhauls, mechanics appreciated the logical layout of the systems, while engineers valued their consistent, predictable performance on the throttle. Through the 50s and early 60s, EMD steadily improved its designs and incorporated lessons learned from millions of miles of real-world operation. The General Purpose GP Series and Special Duty SD Series became the absolute backbone of American railroad operations from coast to coast. These locomotives weren't particularly flashy compared to the dramatic turbines, but they possessed something far more valuable. They worked reliably under all conditions, day after day, year after year. As the 1960s progressed, the railroad industry began changing once again in response to evolving freight demands. Railroads were being asked to haul increasingly heavy trains over steeper grades and longer distances. The competition for maximum horsepower was heating up dramatically in what industry publications dubbed the Horsepower Wars. Then came Union Pacific's announcement of its upcoming 100th anniversary celebration. They wanted something truly special to mark this historic achievement, something that would turn heads, break records, and demonstrate American railroad engineering at its absolute finest. EMD recognized this as the perfect opportunity to make a definitive statement about the future of locomotive technology. They set out to build a machine unlike anything that had ever rolled on American rails, a double-engine monster designed to outlast and outperform any gas turbine or rival diesel locomotive. When Union Pacific requested something truly grand to celebrate its centennial milestone, EMD answered that call with a machine that would permanently alter railroad history, the DDA-40X, better known simply as the Centennial. Built by EMD as a subsidiary of General Motors, the Centennial represented far more than just another diesel locomotive design. This was EMD's definitive engineering statement, a declaration that diesel-electric technology had reached a new pinnacle of power and sophistication. The locomotive was delivered to Union Pacific in 1969, representing what many considered the absolute peak of American locomotive design and manufacturing capability. Understanding the designation system reveals the engineering ambition behind this project. The DD stood for eight powered axles, arranged as two sets of four powered axles each. The A indicated an A-unit configuration with a full control cab at the front end. The 40 referred to the EMD 645E3 prime mover, the same proven engine design used successfully in the SD40 locomotive series. The X designation signified the locomotive's role as both an experimental and advanced production series, incorporating cutting-edge technologies that were later integrated into EMD's broader lineup. The engineering specifications were absolutely staggering for their time. These twin power plants, mounted side-by-side -side along the locomotive's massive frame, produced a combined 6,600 horsepower, making the Centennial the most powerful single-unit diesel-electric locomotive ever constructed for regular service in North America. At nearly 100 feet in total length, it dwarfed most rail equipment and weighed approximately 540,000 pounds when fully fueled and ready for service. Under ideal conditions, it could reach speeds up to 90 miles per hour, though its maximum authorized freight speed was typically 80 miles per hour, an extraordinary feat for the late 1960s. But the Centennial's true genius extended far beyond simple brute force. The locomotive featured advanced modular electronics and sophisticated onboard diagnostic systems, which allowed Union Pacific's maintenance teams to test new technologies under real-world operating conditions.
Many of the innovative systems first tested on the Centennial later became standard features across EMD's entire product lineup, making this locomotive a crucial stepping stone in diesel locomotive evolution. The first production unit, designated UP6900, was ceremonially delivered for the Golden Spike Centennial Celebration, held in Salt Lake City on May 10, 1969. This date marked exactly 100 years since the completion of America's first transcontinental railroad. The moment that the first Centennial rolled into view, wearing Union Pacific's distinctive bright yellow and gray paint scheme, with its massive twin exhaust stacks and the deep, thunderous roar of dual engines, everyone present understood they were witnessing something truly historic. When Union Pacific's mighty gas turbines had roared across the Western Plains during the 1950s and early 1960s, they genuinely looked and sounded like the future of American railroading. But by the end of that transformative decade, it became clear that ultimately, the future belonged to something entirely different, EMD's revolutionary centennial. The fundamental difference between these competing technologies came down to one crucial word, practicality. The turbines were undeniable marvels of raw mechanical power, but they suffered from a critical weakness that made them economically unsustainable, their voracious appetite for fuel. Turbine locomotives achieved their maximum efficiency only when running at full throttle under ideal conditions, but the moment operating requirements forced them to throttle down, whether navigating challenging mountain grades or performing switching duties, fuel consumption immediately skyrocketed to levels that made railroad accountants cringe. In stark contrast, the Centennial's twin diesel engines used fuel far more efficiently across the complete spectrum of operating conditions that railroads encountered every single day. When the 1970s brought the fuel crisis and dramatically higher energy costs, that efficiency difference became absolutely decisive. Reliability represented another major factor that heavily favored diesel-electric technology. Any qualified mechanic working in an EMD-equipped maintenance shop could service a Centennial using familiar tools, standard procedures, and readily available replacement parts. Turbine locomotives required highly specialized equipment and rare technical expertise which only a privileged few railroad depots possessed. Every turbine breakdown meant extended waits for qualified technicians and astronomical repair bills that could devastate a railroad's maintenance budget. Operational flexibility provided yet another significant advantage for the Centennial design. The locomotive could be easily configured in multiple unit arrangements with other compatible locomotives, meaning that engineers could control several powerful engines simultaneously from a single control cab. A tremendous advantage when hauling the heaviest freight trains. Turbine locomotives simply didn't offer that same modular convenience. If a turbine unit failed during a critical run, the entire train operation could be compromised until replacement power arrived. Even the operating crews developed clear preferences based on daily working conditions. While turbines were notoriously loud and harsh to work with, the Centennials offered a smoother, more manageable experience. Despite their massive power output, engineers favored them not just for their performance, but for the comfort they brought to long shifts on the rails. By the early 1970s, it was clear the railroad industry could no longer ignore the economic pressure. Union Pacific began systematically mothballing its entire turbine locomotive fleet as fuel costs continued climbing and maintenance bills accumulated to unsustainable levels. Meanwhile, the Centennials consistently proved themselves as reliable mechanical workhorses, efficiently hauling heavy freight loads from the Great Plains to the Rocky Mountains with impressive ease. In every measurable category that mattered, fuel efficiency, maintenance reliability, crew comfort, and overall operating costs, the Centennial outperformed the turbine. Over the following years, the railroad systematically built up their Centennial roster to 47 total units, numbered sequentially with each locomotive serving as a rolling tribute to American engineering excellence. These yellow giants quickly became familiar sites across Union Pacific's extensive Western Railroad network. Operating regularly from Wyoming through Utah, Nevada, and California on the railroad's most demanding freight routes, with so much horsepower available on demand and an impressive 240,000 pounds of tractive effort, each Centennial could handle virtually anything the railroad's traffic department could assign. 
Despite their imposing physical dimensions, these locomotives handled surprisingly well during extended high-speed runs across the western landscape. Operating crews consistently praised their exceptional strength and stability when running at maximum authorized speeds, though some engineers occasionally expressed concerns about the maintenance challenges inherent in managing two complete engines housed under a single hood. The Centennials frequently operated in multiple unit configurations with other powerful locomotives like SD40-2s or DD35s, creating power combinations that could conquer any mountain grade or desert in Union Pacific's challenging western territory. One of the clearest signs of the Centennial's success was Union Pacific's quiet decision to abandon its expensive turbine program by 1970, opting instead to fully commit to proven diesel electric power. By the late 1970s, the mighty Centennials had accomplished their intended mission and performed exceptionally well throughout their operational careers. But even the most powerful locomotives can't escape the passage of time or shifting economic realities. After more than a decade of demanding service, the DDA-40X fleet began showing clear signs of age and increasing maintenance requirements, which raised concerns among railroad financial planners. The Centennial's two engines brought double the burden, increased maintenance demands, higher fuel consumption, and a more complex parts inventory. As American railroads began systematically tightening their operating budgets, simpler single-engine units like the highly successful SD40-2 became the obvious financial choice for most applications. By the early 1980s, Union Pacific's management made the difficult but economically necessary decision to begin retiring its historic centennial fleet from active service. And by the mid-1980s, Union Pacific retired the majority of its 47-unit fleet, with scrapping continuing into the late 80s and early 90s. However, several units were preserved as museum pieces for future generations. Yet even as the physical centennials gradually disappeared from active railroad operations, their technological legacy continued to influence locomotive development for decades to come. The DDA-40X program had served as an invaluable testbed for numerous innovations that EMD incorporated into future designs. The locomotive's advanced modular electronics, sophisticated onboard monitoring systems, and high-horsepower integration techniques directly influenced the development of EMD's next generation of successful locomotives. The Centennial program also fundamentally changed the entire philosophy of locomotive design throughout the railroad industry. It proved that diesel technology was flexible and could adapt to changing operational needs. Even General Electric learned valuable lessons from the Centennial era. After their expensive turbine experiment ultimately failed to achieve commercial success, GE strategically shifted its entire focus toward building advanced diesel electric locomotives using lessons learned from EMD's success. In the final analysis, the Centennial accomplished far more than simply silencing GE's turbine program it fundamentally reshaped the entire locomotive manufacturing industry. Though most Centennial locomotives were scrapped decades ago, a few still survive today, preserved as lasting symbols of American railroading history. The most significant survivor is UP6936, which holds the unique distinction of being the only Centennial that remained operational into the 21st century. For many years, this historic locomotive served as a centerpiece of Union Pacific's prestigious Heritage Fleet, pulling special excursion trains across the scenic western states. Railroad enthusiasts from across the country would gather along the tracks to experience that deep, thunderous roar of its twin engines under full power, a sound that transported listeners back to the golden age of American railroading.